Hello and welcome to SAE Tomorrow Today. I am your host, Grayson Brolty. On today's episode, we're honored to have Robert Bilby, Senior Director, System Architecture and Product Planning for Automotive Embedded Business Unit in Micron Technology. Micron's a really interesting company. Micron is the fourth largest semiconductor company in the world. It's involved in a lot of aspects of our lives. It's involved in items in your home, and more importantly, it has a huge automotive business. When you're in your vehicle and say, hi car, get directions to grocery store. Hi car, get directions to home. There's a very good chance that's running on Micron memory. Memory is the unsung hero that runs behind the scenes that makes everything work. You have the complete frictionless experience. And on today's podcast, Robert pulls back the curtain and, and talks about all the different ways that memory improves the vehicle experience and, and not only the vehicle experience, how memory improves safety. So you're getting the best of both worlds. You're getting a better user experience and a safer vehicle. That's Micron. Enjoy the conversation. Welcome to the podcast, Robert. Thank you, as always, Grayson. It's uh, ah, nothing short of an absolute pleasure to be here today. So thank you very much. I'm excited to have you here because Micron's an incredible company. You and I have shared stories about what your RAM did to help me win computer games back in the day. And now your memory is enabling all these really wonderful in-vehicle experiences. So I can't wait to dive into that with you. I want to take a step back, though, because you and I share a lot of common traits. And one of them is we both worked in the photography business early in our careers. You were at Eastman Kodak Company, and where I worked was a Kodak store. I'm very proud of that during the heyday of print photography. You said this experience opened your eyes on strategy. Will you please kindly talk about that statement and what you saw working for the Eastman Kodak Company during the heyday? I have a older son that's 30 years old, and um, he had never heard of the word Kodak or the name Kodak. And uh, back in 1986, when I worked for them, Kodak was the second most recognized brand after Coca-Cola. Uh, the value of this, the brand name of Kodak was worth billions of dollars back in the time, back in the day. And um, being able to navigate the landscape in terms of understanding how things are changing. There were people at Kodak that really understood that digi digital photography was going to be the wave of the future. But unfortunately, it was a small set of people that really understood this. And the larger population were convinced that it's still all about traditional photography, 35 millimeter film. And the biggest competition, in fact, was Fujifilm. So Fuji was going to eat everybody's lunch. And this whole digital photography thing was kind of a fad. It was going to be equivalent to what, what was experienced with Polaroid, where you got instant results, picture was more expensive, the quality wasn't there, but Okay, it, it was a niche, but it wasn't the thing that was going to take over the world. And so when we were in the early days of digital photography, people said, yeah, you know, we, we've seen this movie before and, you know, 100 kilobit image picture, et cetera, et cetera. It's just not going to take the world by storm. Focus on Fuji. And so while there were people that focused on digital photography and, in fact, Kodak had invested in verbatim and a bunch of different companies where they realized that perhaps the world was going to change. The larger part of what I would call the aircraft carrier just was focused on traditional photography. And you had a few people that were trying to lean on the side of the aircraft carrier going, no, 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 steer left. But it wasn't sufficient. And not recognizing these significant trends really, really took Kodak into the dirt. And today, Kodak is fundamentally almost non-existent, to be honest. The brand was there and the iconic phrase, it's a Kodak moment. You went to Disney World and they had the Kodak moment spots. It, it Being there, both of us in the trenches during that time, seeing what was coming out of Nikon Olympus was doing great work and they're constantly innovating. I want to switch this over to Micron because Micron has constantly innovated. Yeah. You have the DDR1 that came on. How is Micron constantly innovating around memory where you introduce the DDR1 and didn't sit still and you constantly continue and continue to innovate to build better and better products? Is that cultural for Micron? 
Yeah, it, it is. And it's it's a it's a cultural thing in the semiconductor industry or the successful semiconductor companies recognize what it takes to be successful. And if you're not paying attention to all the nuances and the implications, et cetera, et cetera, of this or that and the other technology, you're going to you're going to, you know, fall asleep at the wheel and you're going to be obsoleted really quickly. I mean, the semiconductor industry is brutal. And there are a lot of companies that were successful in their time and because they missed a pivot point, et cetera, they're not there anymore. And I could go through the whole list of them. So yeah, Micron has realized that it's all about bigger, faster, cheaper performance power area. And it's all about staying ahead of the curve in terms of process technology. In fact, to that extent, I mean, if you look at our recent product announcements, Micron is ahead of the industry against Samsung and Hynix. In fact, you know, to put memory into perspective, Micron is the fourth largest semiconductor company in the world. And so it's Intel, Samsung, Hynix, Micron. So the Number two, number two, number three, number four semiconductor players, it's memory. And so it's all about leveraging process technology to get to bigger, faster, cheaper. So Micron is ahead of the pack, the number two, number three player, both in terms of DRAM and NAND, managed NAND. With DRAM, we're on what we call a one alpha process. So at some point, we don't even know how to measure anything anymore. Is it's seven nanometers, three nanometers? The traditional measures don't make sense anymore. Um, so we're on one alpha, which the industry recognizes as the leading edge process technology for DRAM. And with NAND, we're at 176 layers where we're literally stacking things vertically to build more density, more dice per wafer. And this is this is a mantra of the whole semiconductor industry, which is bigger, faster, cheaper, and you got to get to the next node to be there. And so Micron has made obscene investments to ensure that both with DRAM and managed NAND, we are way ahead of the pack. And that gives us an advantage in terms of cost, power, performance. Uh, versus the competition. It's a great advantage because it's a culture of innovation. You're looking at all the ways that memory is being used in an automobile. And you see the announcements from large OEMs and the screens in the vehicle just keep getting bigger and bigger and, and bigger. And eventually the glass will get augmented. What role will memory play in that experience? Will it eliminate all that friction and, and buffering if you're going to say, okay, car, look up restaurant or okay car play video will the memory allow it to come up instantly so there's there's not that lag it's a it's a system level problem and so while processors get faster and faster if the memory can't keep up in fact this has been really an industry challenge is that while processors have been getting faster and faster memory has been really challenged in terms of keeping up with the performance uh that the processors are seeing. And so at some point it's all, I mean, the concept is, you know, weakest link in the chain. So at some point memory absolutely impacts um, the the system level performance. And there's a point where you can have six, 10, 12, 15 cores in your PC, but if you've got really slow memory, you're never going to get any performance out of the system. So it's, it's a complementary thing. And at some point, Too much performance in memory doesn't give you anything. Too much performance in processing doesn't give you anything. So it's a it's a system level complementary solution. But again, there's been this disparity in terms of the rate at which processing performance has increased versus memory performance. And um, the industry is really, really aware of how do we close that gap? Because at some point, you know, everybody wants this digital user experience where when I'm in my house or in my car or wherever I am, I want, you know, snappy instant performance. And you can't get there without the full system performing at the level that's required to do so. Let me give you an example. Let's say you're driving your car and say, okay, car, play Albert King with the doors live in Vancouver, 1970. Well, instead of this buffering, some devices in my house, 
Grayson, say that again? What do you mean? And it goes to buffering. Does your memory in the vehicle say, whoop, out it, out, out it comes, and you hear those guitars. Is, is that allowing that to go in complements with the processor and all the other onboard compute? If you look at the uh, you know digital assistant model today, they rely upon the cloud for connectivity. And so a lot of the processing, natural language processing, NLP to just be a geek. I love three letter acronyms, so I'm gonna just throw them out there at you. So NLP, if you wanna to get to NLP, typically that's thrown up into the cloud, but in the vehicle, you can't guarantee you're gonna have connectivity. If you're driving through Death Valley, God forbid, or some other place where there's no connectivity, you can't throw this up to the cloud. So you wanna have natural language processing in the vehicle, and so there's a big push to move all of this processing in the vehicle. And again, correspondingly, memory plays a big role in this. Again, I'll throw another three-letter acronym at you, uh, Fully Connected Neural Network, CNN. Lots and lots and lots of complex math. So for those of us who have gone through matrix algebra, there's just a ton of addition and subtraction and multiplication and that becomes really nasty when you start to do this both in processing and then in memory and so memory performance in natural language processing and uh you know again with your digital assistant it's essential to have really really high performance memory and again all this processing needs to be done locally in the vehicle so that at some point it's a seamless thing you don't you 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 shouldn't care where the processing is happening you should just go at some point the the image is going to be hey what's that building over there Uh, or hey that looks like an interesting restaurant Share the menu with me. And immediately, pop, yeah, this is bop, 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 brevet restaurant, and here's the meals. And oh, by the way, Grayson, you seem to be a nice guy. I'm going to give you a 20% discount if you pull off the side of the road. And um, yeah, have a taco on us. And uh, yeah, it's, uh, but all of that requires obscene amounts of compute performance. We just take it all for granted. We don't appreciate how it happens. We shouldn't. The processor is the heart of the system, but without the memory, you're still in trouble. Consumers just want it to work. And that taco place, I could become a loyal customer. This There you go. Discovery exactly. is going to be amazing. I'm going to go back years now. Google had this incredible software they developed for walking around cities where you, you would put on a set of head and it would tell you the history. And I was in Chicago years ago, and I put it was incredible. All this history of all these different buildings that they were pointing out because they knew your location. And I was like, okay, that's the first thing. And imagine when that goes to the car, and and your memory can enable all these experiences here in Chicago. Oh, Al Capone hung out here. Okay, this is cool, and you you learn all this stuff. That's cool. There's, yeah. There's not a plaque on the building. As you continue to innovate, is this where the one A DRAM comes in to allow developers to go even to that next level in vehicle? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at at the end of the day, what's happening in the vehicle is that there's just there's an obscene transformation that that's happening in the vehicle. And what I love to tell people is that 130 years ago, when the vehicle was first introduced, it was a lot of innovation, so on and so forth. But what we're seeing today reflects a transformation that is far beyond what we even saw back then. And the industry is moving towards a software platform on wheels. And so literally almost anything that you can imagine at some point with the, you know, digital convergence used to be a cool term about 10 years ago or so, but it's all about, you know, GPS, voice, video, you name it. And, you know, all of the stuff is now accessible in the vehicle. And ultimately what's happening is this is reshaping the purchasing decision of the vehicle. So if you go to the largest automotive show today, it's not in Detroit. Yeah, you know, people give a glance and a look to the engine and the transmission, the styling, the exterior of the vehicle is still important. But the next thing is, let's look at the cockpit. And does my Apple CarPlay work? And do I have this wonderful experience? And can I drive down the road and suddenly get a tour of, yeah, Al Capone used to live here or he went to jail here or he, uh, let me not talk about maybe what he did or didn't do, but um, to use the GE term, we bring good things to life. And so at some point, 
to put things into perspective, the fact that Micron is the number four, and we're just a pure play memory supplier, we're the fourth largest semiconductor supplier in the world, reflects the fact that memory is really, really important. And it's important in everything. And it's becoming more important in the car as the car is becoming a, a, a platform where there's going to be financial transactions, interactions with people, interactions with other vehicles. Um, and in fact, once the car is driving itself, the biggest challenge that the OEMs are facing is how do I define brand identity and why would somebody pick a BMW versus a Daimler versus uh, uh, Toyota, Lexus, etc. And it's all about, it is all moving towards that user experience in the cockpit. And so when you go to CES, everybody just stares at what are the cool things that you have in the cockpit? And there are 20, 30, 40 replicants of a cockpit. And there's maybe one vehicle that's a prototype vehicle of something that's a you know futuristic thing it's not even real but everybody is now making their purchasing decision based upon all the electronics in the vehicle spot on about ces and there's another trend i put my wall street hat on i like that did it in too so you're robert the lawyer so very good move mr lawyer sir yeah <laughs> and i'm gonna i'm gonna put you put your lawyer hat on i'm gonna put my my banking hat on here <laughs> Last week, JP Morgan made an announcement, very quiet, didn't get a lot of buzz, but me being me, I found it. They acquired a majority stake over 70% of VW's finance business. And in the press release, it was specifically called, this was official JP Morgan press release, in-vehicle commerce is now moving 100% over to JP Morgan and getting put in their payment tech business. Yeah, that's gonna that's a big sign. You've got I believe they're the largest bank by deposits in the United States going into in vehicle commerce to put that payment layer on top of the experiences that you and I have described. Yeah, yeah, it comes fascinating. Now, let's let's talk about this a little bit. And JP Morgan is just a piece of this. So I mean, let's talk about Tesla. Tesla selling. I don't know what they call it, but autonomous driving. It's a subscription based service, right? So they're telling you, you pay me a thousand bucks a month, a week, a year, whatever, to get full functional safety driving. So you don't need to drive your own vehicle. This is a whole new business model. I mean, it used to be you bought your car and then the dealer was hoping that you would bring it in for service and so on and so forth. Now there's a whole new business model. And the business model is anywhere from let me sell you fully autonomous driving or different levels of autonomous driving and you pay me on a monthly basis and it's not only just the oems that are getting into this nvidia is also publicly announcing that with their Orin platform etc cetera, etc cetera, they're going to get a piece of the action as well uh, and so that's just one piece of it then the other piece of it is that everybody's realizing that you know what you're going to be sitting in your car the car is going to be driving itself okay, you've got two to three hours a day of, well, I mean, it depends where you are, but, you know, some period of time where you're just sitting there going, hmm, what do I do with my time? And so this is where people are going to make financial transactions. So there's a lot of purchasing that's going on. If you look at Google, Google is really aggressively pushing Android into the vehicle. And in fact, what they're doing is they say, hey, if you give me all the access to the data, the Android platform is, is free to you, Mr. OEM and Tier 1. But if you don't give me access to the data, you're going to pay me a, a subscription service. So everybody is now looking at a vehicle as something that's going to generate revenue. And, uh, you know, again, it's not just you buy the car. It's this long-term revenue generation stream and nobody knows how it's all going to play out exactly but um yeah i mean this is i i hadn't heard about the jp morgan thing but that's a very forward looking thing but this is absolutely capturing the dynamics and this is why i come back to we used to be we used to think that cars were great and they got us from point a to point b and that was wonderful but where we're headed today it's it's off the charts. It's just it, the innovations and the amount of technology is 
there's no comparison. There is no comparison. The one thing that you can look at a comparison with the, the, going back to the finance, not putting my banker hat back on, no matter where the, the software as a service goes, whoever owns that payment layer in the vehicle is going to get one penny here, 1% there. And you multiply that across millions of vehicles. That's a very big business. We can look at the public markets, look at Visa or look at MasterCard. Their numbers are public. That adds up very, very quickly. And that is a highly profitable business. MasterCard's margins are pushing 70%. Yeah. Those are, those are Apple-esque margins, even yeah. better than Apple. Yeah. And, and this is what's driving the OEMs to figure out how do they accelerate their footprint into getting into throwing more and more electronics into the vehicle to make that happen. Because they're trying to figure out how do they get a piece of this action, right? I mean, why should I hand this over to JP Morgan or somebody else? GM is going to transform themselves into not only building cars, blah, 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 but generating revenue through transactions. So why should I give that money to somebody else? Why should I give this insight to data to somebody else? Uh, at a minimum, I should sell it to somebody else. So the whole model of the vehicle is being completely rethought and uh, nobody knows what the right answer is. Um, but what everybody realizes is that there's money to be made here. And uh, I, I can tell you across the board, I mean, if you look at Ford, you look at GM, you look at the US automakers, European automakers, etc. cetera, uh, they're all scrambling to figure out how do they get themselves aligned with this new paradigm? Because this, this new paradigm is real. And uh, if they're on the outside looking in, um, they're gonna regret that, so. Which puts Micron in a great position because you're you're the memory layer, and then uh, to make this happen, you need five G or or LTE. What role will memory play with with five G? Yeah, in general, we're in a great position. So we're selling blue jeans or gold mining pants to the gold miners. So maybe you don't hit it rich, but we're going to hit it rich either way. Um, but uh, with 5G, I mean, it's, uh, it's a very enabling technology. So one of the big things that's coming from or 5G is going to enable is the bandwidth, the sheer bandwidth that it provides is going to allow uh, the concept of over the air updates. And so when you look at the software footprint for most vehicles or future vehicles, it's going to go from like 100 million lines of codes to 300 million lines of code. And, you know, at the end of the day, there is no other embedded application that has that much software associated with it. And so you can imagine the need for regular and rigorous updates, because at some point, I mean, it's it almost feels like every other week, it's either my Windows platform requires a security update or my iOS requires a security update. And I want to assume that the vehicles will will avoid this, but there's a lot of you know people that try to figure out how to be unscrupulous. And so there's going to be a need for updates as well as just communication between vehicles. So 5G is going to enable vehicle to vehicle communication. So, you know, you see these horrific incidents where in a, in a whiteout, one car will get in an accident and there's just this continuous pileup because nobody knows what's going on. 5G will allow vehicles to talk to each other and figure out, hey, there's an accident in front of me and, you know, let's slow down or even stop the vehicle. Um, memory in this point is going to be really important for just buffering all this communication, as well as one of the important things, obviously, is to, but well, maybe not obviously, is to also provide security where at some point I don't want this, you know, I've got now a access into the vehicle through wireless and I need to make sure that the messages, the software updates, et cetera, et cetera, are not malicious attacks. And so memory will play a key role in terms of providing root of trust, buffering of messages, so on and so forth. When you look at the root of trust, over the air updates are only going to expand. My car, for whatever reason, I, I, I tweet at them. I go into the dealership. The gentleman owns the dealership, lives down the, down the road from me. I said, come on, get over the air updates. He said, it's coming, it's coming. With the, with the root of trust, can you explain that, how that helps secure it through the memory? 
I've got you on video. Um, you and I have had enough conversation, so I know what Grayson looks like. <laughs> so if I, I, I were to see a guy with uh, a bald guy without a beard and whatnot, I go, OK, that's not Grayson. So first of all, Ruben Frost just says that uh, I know who you are and I can understand who you are. And that's an important thing because I don't want to share any information with you that may be confidential, that could cause the opportunity to corrupt the, the system. So root of trust is really about authentication as, I mean, you can get, you can geek out into all kinds of language and security. It's a three letter acronym. It's a wonderful landscape for three letter acronyms, but um, root of trust says, I know who you are. I, I can trust who you are. And so when I provide updates, so on and so forth, um, I know that when I'm getting these updates, they are from a person I can trust and the data I can trust, et cetera, et cetera. And if you don't, if you can't have that basic bedrock to work from, you're just going to download stuff that could be from anyone. It could be nefarious. Who knows? Well, I mean, again, if we're saying that there's, you know, JP Morgan is going to be interested in transactions in the vehicle. So at a minimum, I can clean out your bank account. At a maximum, I can take your car and drive it into a brick wall or or even more malicious than that. So security is really important. And the first thing, the, the starting point is when somebody says, I want to do this over the air update, I have the ability to, to recognize that the person that's giving me this update is in fact a reliable source. Will all these updates in the memory of running be, be energy intensive as the shift to electric vehicles, range anxiety is, is front and center with a lot of folks? Or do we have to worry about the, the, the battery life going down and they're not able to get the, the average estimated drive because of all the, the GPUs, the memory and everything? Yeah, the, the, the challenge is that when we start to move towards level five autonomous driving, the closer and closer we, we move towards a self-driving vehicle, the more power that's required from a semiconductor technology standpoint. So, you know, a self-driving vehicle, I mean, under any conditions, level five, I, I still think there's a lot of room for improvement and what it's going to take to make that happen. And, and so L5 basically says you're driving down the road and at some point somebody's decided that there's a pothole or something that is a problem and they just throw a cone out there and you and I see the cone and go, okay, psh, I'll navigate past the cone. Does the car have the intelligence to do this? And so that's at trillions of operations per second in terms of compute performance. And so memory to keep up with that also consumes a lot of power so yeah at the end of the day it is indeed a power intensive problem and the challenge is indeed how do we drive that down and this is really going to be achieved by a lot of collaboration with both the soc suppliers and the memory suppliers to get there and i, I actually i'm not sure if i actually, i'm not sure if i actually answered your question grace and so if i didn't hit me again on that no it was it was really healthy the following on that is micron actively working with your automotive partners to help reduce energy consumption do you have these incredible scientists and engineers in the lab or running various different scenarios to help reduce the energy yeah, no, it's, um, you know, the, the interesting thing is that memory is still a commodity product. So people want to end up in the same footprint with the same capability and the same functionality. Um, but that said, this is absolutely why we're pushing on the bleeding edge process technology, because as soon as we start to move to one alpha, anytime you start to shrink the die size of uh, a given semiconductor product, uh, typically what you see is a significant improvement in cost, performance, but also power. And so this is true both for managed NAND, where we're going to 176 layers. So rather than build things in the horizontal direction, we're, we're moving into the vertical direction. So think skyscrapers okay 176 story skyscraper versus 176 
houses going across the land. Um, so absolutely through getting to the next node, there are significant savings in terms of power. And uh, yeah, the biggest issue or one of the biggest issues with electrical vehicles is indeed this range anxiety, as, as you put it. Another major trend besides range anxiety that, that's popping up before we get to level four is in-vehicle cabin monitoring. If somebody left an item in their in the vehicle that they were traveling in or if a child was left un- unattended and also driver monitoring is the driver paying attention is is micron playing in that and enabling your your the incredible memory you have because where you, when you're doing driver monitoring or there's an individual left as a child left in the back you need to know instantly yeah the, you know and and to that extent i mean if we could get our if we could get everybody to listen to us in Washington, D.C. and all the other geographies. I think there's a ton of technology that's available today that if, you know, in the same way that rear camera is a mandatory feature on vehicles, if we could put, if we could accelerate the adoption of driver monitoring system and uh, occupant monitoring systems as becoming a mandatory feature, I think we would see a significant reduction in the, you know, incidents, uh, with a vehicle. And, uh, you know, what's interesting is that at some point, while we're adding all these additional safety features, et cetera, et cetera, in the vehicle, the unfortunate thing is that with cell phones and people texting while driving, it's offsetting all the benefits that we're seeing from all these features. And so driver monitoring provides a profound impact on vehicle incidents. And I, I always try to use my choose my words carefully. It, it is something like 97% of the incidents are based on human failure. And 94% of that 97% are based upon the fact that the driver's distracted. Micron's doing all this great stuff for society and local communities. And you've got this incredible customer base. How are you working with your customers to unlock the true potential of Micron Memory Solutions? Yeah, it's, um, you know, it's actually for me, it's a very exciting time because um, I am responsible for system architecture team. And really, we're at the point where the standard light bulb that you buy off the shelf that you can screw into any socket, 75 watts, 30 watts. You don't need to think too hard about that. That's still possible, but if we get deeper engagements with our customers, we can add features, functionality, capability that leads to significantly greater benefits in terms of understanding you know, what the environment looks like, so on and so forth. So as an example, Micron has taken the lead in the area of safety, and there's two pieces to safety. The first piece of safety is you should design a product that uses best in class design methodologies that are aligned to the auto industry and SAE, I'm sure you're well aware, ASIL A through D. You've got a design methodology that's compliant with ASIL D, the most stringent process. From there, there's, um, so there's systematic fault coverage and and then there's random fault, fault coverage, which is just like, who knows what's gonna cause a memory to give you the result that you hadn't expected. It could be neutron flux, it could be aging, it could be whatever. And the issue isn't necessarily to stop that from happening because it just happens. And, you know, we try to design things to the best of the best possible integrity, but at some point it happens. And so when it happens, we want to be able to flag the system so the system can take the right response. And so sometimes the right response is, ah, it's a pixel in your display, who cares? At the other extreme, it's something that's gonna affect your anti-lock braking system. And in that case, you wanna be able to recognize that's a problem and just take the car and hobble that off to the side of the, uh, uh, of the road. So in that context, working closely with customers to be able to not only identify those features, but then have the customers be able to figure out, okay, now that you have, now that we have these features, how do you use those features to ensure that you can take the correct actions? And so a close partnership allows us to figure out how do we tune the product so that we 
deliver what's important to the market and we end up with a cost-effective product that ultimately supports what's necessary and doesn't support those things that are not necessary. And as we move down each node, it gets more and more complicated to go figure that out. And this requires a much, much closer touch with our customers. Robert, could you share some real world examples of collaboration and how Micron's working with partners to introduce new technologies into the field? Yeah, absolutely. So um, a couple different places that uh, you're gonna see a lot of press coming from Micron in, in the not too distant future. One of the areas that I think we talked about a little bit earlier was uh, in the area of CV to X, so that's cellular vehicle to anything communications. CV to X is, um, is, a, is a great example of a technology that we're working with. One of the leaders, we work with you know all the leaders in the market, but uh, one of the areas that we've been putting a lot of focus on is working with a company called Autotox. They're in Israel. Autotox has got a, an outstanding solution, and, and the solution is we're closely coupled with them with both storage and DRAM. They've got a full solution stack that uh, really solves this problem. And uh, depending upon the geography in China, it's becoming a mandate. You're seeing aggressive deployments of VDX in China. You, you'll also see that, you know, we're actually looking beyond all that with robo taxis. So we're talking about helicopters that will get you from rooftop to rooftop in New York via t air taxi. And we've made significant investments in this company, Volocopter. And what we're doing is we're working with them very closely. And the reason we invest in these and work closely with them is we, we need to understand what are the requirements that they need in order to be successful. And we feed those into our products so we can not only service today and tomorrow and the next days, but the day beyond that in terms of technologies. Robert, put, putting this entire conversation into context, we've covered a lot of ground, talked a lot about a lot of really cool things. What is the future of memory and what role do you expect Micron to play in that future? Memory is, again, it's kind of been the unsung hero, but again, if I reflect on the fact that when you look at the semiconductor industry, Number number two, three, four semiconductor suppliers are memory. So memory is just this thing that people maybe don't pay attention to because the processors are, you know, more exciting and interesting. Um, but overall, when we start to look at the impact that memory has on system and system performance, and power, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think what we're going to find is a, a, a greater sense of um, end application understanding and tuning of the products to address the requirements of the end application. And so, for example, if I look at artificial intelligence and I look at Again, wonderful TLA, fully connected neural nets, but really what this is all about is a lot of math. And there's just a ton of transactions where I'm doing a multiplication by a coefficient. That coefficient is in memory. I go, okay, let me go get that coefficient from memory. I bring it back, I multiply it, I then store it, then I get another number, I multiply it by another coefficient, and then I add it together. So every time I use that energy to go back and forth, I'm doing something that's that's meaningful. And so there's terms called processing in memory, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I, I, I think in time, this is going to be this is going to be a, a increase in significance and importance as the industry ties, tries to grapple with how do you squeeze the next, you know, 10, 30, 50 percent out of memory in, in performance and power. Robert, really well done on that. I think it's super savvy. It's super smart. And as we look to wrap up this insightful conversation, what would you like the listeners to take away with them? I, I think the takeaway is that a automotive market is a really difficult market to support. It's a market that's going through a lot of transitions. I, I, I read an article recently, like this morning, from Pat Gelsinger that said we need to really 
recognize the fact that Pat Gelsinger of Intel CEO, he said, we need to recognize the fact that yesterday's automotive market is not today's automotive market. And so yesterday's automotive market used to use mature technologies. Semiconductors weren't really the drivers in terms of defining the capabilities and, and the selling point of the vehicle. That world has changed. And in order to support that world, the, the mindset of using products that are mature and proven and have longevity, that now needs to shift to where we need to start to look at some of the leading edge products from a memory standpoint, as well as all the semiconductors. And I think as a whole, the industry needs to recognize that we are going through a big transformation and where historically, you know, at some point it was, you know, the PC that drove memory, then it was networking that drove memory, then it's the cloud that drove memory. Now it's automotive that's driving memory. And we're kind of stuck in this weird space where we've got in some geographies, people just pushing GDDR6, give me GDDR6X. Let's just use the blazing fast leading edge stuff. And then we have other geographies where I want to use DDR3 and make sure that it's around for 10 years. That's too large of a space to support. And we need to figure out how to align on, you know, how do we how do we get to the best place for all parties concerned. And so I think as a whole, we need to recognize the fact that the automobile is driving memory requirements, driving memory technologies. The industry needs to embrace the fact that while the automotive industry used to rely on trailing nodes, we now need to start to look at leading nodes and we'll still provide the longevity for those leading nodes. But if you want to stay on, an, on a mature node, what you're going to find is that there's not enough volume to drive down the costs. In fact, the costs will increase over time because the volumes start to decrease, et cetera, et cetera. So where the rest of the industries are, are today with regards to memory, where they rely on bleeding edge technology, networking, cloud, computers, PCs, et cetera, et cetera, clients, automotive is still, for the most part, back in the dark ages, and they need to now move to where the rest of the industry is headed. Because again, this is not a vehicle that's bended metal and transmission and engine. It's it's software platform on wheels. And um, if you want the best and the baddest, and you want level five, and you want it at 75 watts, et cetera, et cetera. You have to embrace the industry's leading technologies, full stop, not only from an SOC standpoint, but also from a from a memory standpoint. And I see different geographies that are embracing this, but there's still more, more catch up to happen. Software is going to define the future of the vehicle. Memory is going to play a critical role in that future. And over the air updates is also going to play a critical role. But the one common denominator without really great, fully optimized memory, this is all going to fall apart. With application-aware memory, this will all happen. Robert, I thank you so much for coming on the SAE Tomorrow Today podcast because today is tomorrow, tomorrow is today, and the future is Micron. Robert, thank you so much, sir. My absolute pleasure, Grayson, as always. Thank you for listening to SAE Tomorrow Today. Be sure to tune in next week when we talk with Karina Ricks, Director, Department of Mobility and Infrastructure for the City of Pittsburgh, about the launch of Move PGH and the work she and her team are doing to prepare the city for the future. If you've enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please kindly rate, review, and let us know what topics you'd like for us to explore next by emailing us at podcast at sae.org. That's podcast at sae.org. And be sure to follow us on LinkedIn to stay connected and to continue the conversation. SAE International makes no representations as to the accuracy of the information presented in this podcast. The information and opinions are for general information only. SAE International does not endorse, approve, recommend, or certify any information, product, process, service, or organization presented or mentioned in this podcast.